One thing I love about RPGs and adventure games is that everyone has a very unique experience with them. Everyone has their favourite characters that never leave their party, or their favourite weapons, abilities, or strategies, and even things like small rules that players will impose on themselves to stay more immersed. Some people also like challenge runs to keep multiple playthroughs fresh and exciting. The most popular example would probably be speedrunning, but there are also things like solo character runs, the Final Fantasy V 4-job fiesta that's gained popularity lately, where players try and beat Final Fantasy V with 4 randomly selected character classes, but my personal favourite would have to be the low level run. While it's satisfying to see your party face stronger and stronger foes, gain more experience and see the numbers and stats grow higher, there's something just as satisfying about intentionally keeping your party as weak as the game will allow you to, but still managing to take out the game's strongest enemies. On the surface, it seems like low-level strategies and speedrun strategies would be nearly identical, but this isn't always the case. In Final Fantasy VIII, the strength of the enemies and bosses you face is based on an average of your party's levels. So in the speedrun, you would want to keep your party as weak as possible to take advantage of the fact that in that game, you can raise your stats without raising your level. In Final Fantasy III Pixel Remaster though, speedrunners will intentionally keep at least one party member dead throughout the entire run as this means that EXP earned is only being divided amongst three party members rather than four. Additionally, the current speedrun strategies rely on a few sections where runners will stay in one area and grind for EXP, as it takes less time to grind up your levels to face stronger bosses than it does to gather the necessary spells and gear to take them on at a lower level. In Final Fantasy X, encounters are frequent enough that speedrunners have found a way to actually incorporate them into the current strategies, but you never really sit and grind in the same way as Final Fantasy III. However, in Final Fantasy X, some runners have taken this low-level challenge to a whole new level, doing what they refer to as the No Sphere Grid Run, or NSG for short. To fully understand why this run is so fascinating, we'll need to take a look into the Sphere Grid itself, and how your party in Final Fantasy X gets stronger throughout the game. When you defeat an enemy in Final Fantasy X, the party members that were involved in that battle gain a split of the EXP earned. This means that even if all that party member did was switch in, defend, and then switch back out for a stronger party member, they'll still gain XP, they just need to perform an action in that battle. When they gain a certain amount of XP, rather than gaining a level and a general boost in stats like other RPGs or adventure games, you gain a sphere level. Players can spend one sphere level and a corresponding sphere on this grid, a skill tree of sorts, to gain anything from individual stat points to health boosts to magic abilities and other special attacks. What makes this unique is that even if you're doing the bare minimum amount of fights in the game, gaining stats is not forced on the player. You could theoretically gain hundreds and hundreds of levels, but if you don't actually cash in those sphere levels on the sphere grid, you don't actually gain any stats on your abilities. It's completely up to the player. Now I should mention that the community has decided that the flea ability can be learned in NSG, as all this does is allow Titus, the protagonist of the game, to have the whole party flee from a battle in a single turn, rather than having each party member escape manually. There's no benefit whatsoever when it comes to the actual fights themselves, and there's no stat gain from this ability either, thus it's seen as a bit of quality of life for the runners. In short, runners must rely on the limited abilities that the party members have learned by default, as well as items, overdrives, and specific pieces of armour and weapons to gain the upper hand on bosses. I'll also briefly mention that there are some very minor differences between the HD remaster and the original PS2 versions when it comes to speedrunning, but I'll keep it simple by focusing primarily on the HD version. Additionally, there are going to be some story spoilers, but I'll try and keep it light. With all that said though, let's look at the run in some more detail. The game opens with Titus, our protagonist, taking part in a Blitzball match in the city of Xanakand when it's attacked by Sin, the game's primary enemy. Titus meets with his family friend Oren, and the two start to fight their way through the commotion. When compared to the any percent speedrun, the strategies are mostly the same for the first few sections of the run. The battle system features an indicator of the upcoming turn order, and will show you in advance how your decisions will impact this turn order. Runners will use this to help them make decisions in battle. After becoming separated from Oren, Titus meets up with Riku and a crew of Albed, who are somewhat outcasts due to their heavy use of Machina, machines that are typically forbidden as they're blamed for the creation of Sin. We dive underwater to uncover a sunken airship. On the way, there's a chance to run into piranha enemies, which Riku will attempt to steal grenades from, and Titus will attack. But why is Titus attacking? What's the point of fighting when you aren't allowed to cash in your sphere levels? Item drops. See, while Riku can steal grenades, the piranhas also have a chance of dropping them when killed. 
We're trying to gather six grenades total here for an upcoming boss, so fighting these piranhas can be used to take a little bit of the workload off of Riku. We then fight Tross, a boss who likes to run away from the player, but fortunately for us, he can't run farther than Riku can throw, and grenades still work perfectly underwater. As mentioned earlier, it takes about six grenades and a few attacks to take him down. After we salvage the big prize, Riku informs us that Zanakin was destroyed over a thousand years ago, so Titus seems to have travelled forward in time somehow. We become separated from our new friend once again as the boat is attacked by Sin, and Titus wakes up in Besaid, a small island village. Here Titus meets Waka, a ranged physical attacker, Lulu, a black mage, Kimari, who can learn enemy skills, sometimes referred to as blue magic, and Yuna, a white mage who can summon powerful Aeons to fight alongside the party. Titus joins them on their journey to gather all of the Aeons and defeat Sin. On the way to the next temple to get their second Aeon, runners will make sure to build up their first Aeon Valifor's Overdrive in advance for an upcoming boss. The Overdrive gauge is located just underneath the character's health bar here, and accumulates during battles, granting access to powerful attacks once full. On the way to Kilika, we face Sin. Runners make good use of their ranged attacks and Valor 4's overdrive to quickly make Sin retreat, at least for now. Aeons are a huge part of both the Any% run as well as the NSG run as they become stronger with the party in various ways. In Any% runners will make sure to level up Yuna as much as they can, as the Aeon stats are based somewhat on her own. Given that runners can't raise Yuna's stats in NSG, they rely on the other method of strengthening Aeons. Aeons have another method of gaining stats, which is based on the number of battles you've been in. These battles can include random encounters, both those you've won and those you've fled from, forced encounters, and even boss fights. This even includes those that took place prior to meeting any other characters. An Aeon's stats will raise every 30 battles, starting on your 60th battle. Rather than running in circles and hoping to get encounters quickly enough, runners will wait until they're on the way to the Kilika Temple in the forest where Lord Oku resides one of the game's first optional bosses, and one that we're also able to flee from. Runners will spend about 25 minutes starting and subsequently fleeing from the fight with Lord Oku to build up their encounter total to 159. It's also tradition that runners will listen to Agadu while grinding out these encounters. Runners progress through the game, meeting their second Aeon and fighting a few more bosses with very similar strategies to what you'll see in the typical Any% percent speedrun. On the way to the town of Luka for the big Blitzball tournament, runners will buy the stunning steel weapon from Awaka, a travelling merchant. This weapon has the ability Slow Touch. When attacking an enemy, this weapon has a chance of inflicting slow and making the target's turns less frequent. In the Any% percent run, whether or not we win or lose the Blitzball match is actually a huge determining factor for the rest of the run as the winning prize is a strength sphere and has a surprisingly large impact on the strategies that follow. This of course is no use to us here, so in the NSG run, players simply try and finish the Blitzball match as fast as they can. After the match, the stadium becomes flooded with fiends. In the commotion, Titus meets Auron once again, who joins the party after the fiends are dealt with. On the Meehan High Road, encounters usually aren't too scary, but in the No Sphere Grid run, runners will need to make sure they heal up after every battle, as if Titus gets attacked and dies, it makes our likelihood of escaping pretty dire and risks a game over. During this trip, runners will make sure that Kimari learns the enemy skill self-destruct from a bomb, which does a huge burst of damage at the cost of his party slot. Against the Chocobo Eater boss, runners intentionally try to get pushed off the side of this cliff, as in addition to the fight being shorter, the lower mountain path is also shorter. After making their way through the Mushroom Rock Road, the party meets Maester Seymour, a prominent political figure of Spira who has taken a liking to Yuna. He invites them to join Operation Meehan, a plan to try and use forbidden Machina weapons to take down Sin. The plan fails, and runners will need to fight more Sin spawn and make use of Kamari's new self-destruct move and Yuna's Aeons to do so. After the tragic failure of Operation Meehan, the party heads to the Jose Temple to get their third Aeon. On the way, runners will make sure to pick up the Stone Breath enemy skill for Kimari, an AoE attack that turns all enemies to stone unless they're immune. If all enemies in the battle have been turned to stone, the fight ends straight away. We'll use this later. 
After more journeying through various parts of Spira, Yuna gets kidnapped by someone piloting a giant Machina. Tidus and Waka will dive underwater to take on this Machina and try and rescue Yuna. Runners will make use of Stunning Steel to try and inflict Slow on this boss with Tidus' attacks. Once Slow has been inflicted, Runners will switch Tidus' weapon to either the Lightning Steel if it was dropped earlier by another boss, or the Brotherhood if not, as these weapons deal more damage. After this, the party finishes their Shupuff ride and finds a familiar face washed up on the shore. As it turns out, Riku is not only still alive, but was the one piloting that Machina and joins as the final member of our party. Here we're introduced to a fundamental part of Final Fantasy X speedrunning and one that is critical to the NSG run being viable, Riku's Overdrive Mix. This allows Riku to combine two items for a more potent effect. She can mix for various results such as huge AoE damage, a massive boost to the party's defense, and some other effects that we'll look more into later. After meeting with Maester Seymour shortly in his home at the Guado Salam, the party heads through the Thunder Plains on their way to the Makalania Temple. Runners will have Riku attempt to steal various items from enemies they'll encounter on the way, such as Electro Marbles to deal lightning damage, Lunar Curtains and Light Curtains to increase physical and magic defense, and Chocobo Feathers to boost a character's speed. These items will help both with mixing and to make up for our lack of stats throughout the NSG run. Runners will also use manual escapes to force enemies to attack a specific friendly target, as when a character has escaped, the player can no longer game over if the remaining characters all die. This strategy is used to build overdrives a lot faster and more reliably. As runners make their way through the Makalania woods, they'll look out for some more steals, particularly arctic winds and fish scales for blizzard damage and water damage respectively. We picked up some bomb cores earlier for fire damage and now have all four of our elements covered. A neat optimization in this area is that runners will intentionally run into these butterflies, triggering the butterfly hunt minigame. Tita stumbles for a second when you run into one, but it prevents random encounters until you reach the next screen. We meet Owaka again and pick up the Sonic Steel, a weapon that gives the wielder first strike, guaranteeing them the first turn in every battle, including boss fights. The Spheromorph boss is the first instance where we see just how strong Riku's mix can be. This boss will attack with a specific element, being weak to the element of its counter. Now that we have the first turn in every fight, runners will have Tidus immediately switch out for Riku, who will throw a grenade to trigger a counter attack so that they can learn its weakness. Now that they know what it's weak to, runners will have Riku mix a magic defense sphere with one of the elemental attack items they picked up on the way for repeated hits of the boss's weakness, taking it out instantly. After making our way through the tail end of the woods, we come up to another Machina fight, the Crawler. This boss is paired with a Negator which prevents magic and summons. After 5 turns, the Crawler will use Mana Beam, an extremely powerful magic attack that hits the whole party. In the Any% percent speedrun, the party is strong enough for runners to be able to take out the Crawler before seeing Mana Beam at all. However, in NSG, runners will need to use a Lunar Curtain that they picked up earlier to boost Oren's magic defense so that he can survive this attack and revive the other members of the party. Once Oren revives Riku, and now that she's taken enough damage to build another overdrive, runners use another mix, combining Lightning Marvel and a level 2 Key Sphere to deal a huge amount of thunder damage to this boss for another quick kill. At this point, runners will make sure that they've racked up a total of 240 encounters before entering the next temple to ensure that our Aeons can keep up with the next boss. We finally reach the Makalania Temple and find out that Maester Seymour's intentions are far more sinister than we thought, and he becomes a villain to the party and their goal to defeat Sin. We start our first battle against Seymour and his two Guado bodyguards. These bodyguards will jump in the way of any physical attacks that happen to target Seymour, but aren't able to counter overdrives and special attacks. Runners start with Titus' Spiral Cut Overdrive, throw an elemental attack item with Riku, and then have Kimari self-destruct to take us to the second phase of the fight. If you're familiar with the Any% percent strategy, this is quite jarring, as even despite the increase in strength, losing a whole party member in Any% percent would be quite detrimental, let alone without the Sphere Grid. In the second phase, Seymour will summon Anima, a powerful Aeon that stopped the Fiend's attack on the Blitzball Stadium earlier. Anima will open with a single target attack that will kill one of our two remaining party members. Whoever lives will switch out for Yuna, who summons our fourth Aeon Shiva, who becomes a very important part of the NSG run here on out. 
Shiva will use Blizzard magic to deal damage to Anima and also on herself to heal as she absorbs Blizzard damage and take out Anima to head into the third and final phase of this fight against Seymour on his own. Runners will simply use Shiva's overdrive Diamond Dust to close out this fight. It's quickly discovered that the party killed Maester Seymour, and they are immediately on the run as fugitives, as nobody will believe that they were the good guys in that situation. During their escape, they're attacked by the Wendigo, an enemy with a huge amount of strength and physical defense. In the any percent speedrun, we're able to cast haste on the party to keep up with the Wendigo's attacks, but in NSG, runners will mix a grenade and a stat sphere for Chaos Grenade, which not only heavily reduces defensive stats, but will inflict slow, poison, darkness, silence, and sleep on any targeted hits, though most bosses are immune to one or all of these status ailments. In this fight, the Wendigo is susceptible to sleep. Runners will then use strong spells as Shiva, as magic will not wake up a sleeping enemy. After we take out the Wendigo, the frozen lake below us gives way, and the party finds themselves underneath the Markalanian Temple. They discuss what their plans are going forward, before realising they're actually on Sin's back, and shortly after, become separated in the Beacon Hill Desert. Titus wakes up alone on the shore of the desert, and after a scripted battle, where we are reunited with Oren and Lulu, the player needs to regroup with each party member one by one. We eventually meet up with all but Yuna, and on our way to home, a secret Albed hideout, Runners will attempt to steal at least 15 throwable items for future battles such as smoke bombs and silence grenades. Our path to home is blocked by a Sandragora here. If you take this fight, the strategy is to switch Auron in and use his shooting star overdrive to exit the enemy from the battle. There does exist a skip here where you can position yourself carefully against the edge of the sand pit and Riku pushes you through, however we're trying to raise our encounter total as high as we can, so taking this fight is usually beneficial in the long run. No pun intended. At this point, we discover that home is under siege by Guado, taking revenge on our attack against Seymour. This is concerning, as the location of home has remained a secret to all outsiders until now. We enter home looking for Yuna, and have several forced encounters. We use petrified grenades and Kamari's stone breath to turn all remaining enemies into stone, and finish these fights instantly. Eventually, we discover that Yuna isn't at home at all and Titus learns that the only way she and other summoners are able to defeat Sin is to sacrifice themselves. With the siege on home becoming far too overwhelming, the Albed decide to flee with the summoners and remaining Albed, and destroy home altogether. The party learns that Yuna is trapped in Bavel and is being forced into a marriage with an undead Maester to Seymour. At a shop on board the ship, runners will pick up a Shimmering Blade and a Devastator to give Oren and Riku some extra damage, as well as some armor that gives Oren and Kimari an extra 10% max health. At this point, the party takes on Evre, a large fiend whose purpose is to protect Bavel. No matter how much knowledge or experience you have with this game, this is a tough boss. Prior to making this video, I wouldn't have even been able to guess how you'd do this without the Sphere Grid. The two primary moves that Evre will use are a single target physical attack, as well as a powerful poison breath attack. In the any% percent speedrun, the only reason you would ever see this poison breath attack is if you lost Blitzball a few hours ago, or made a mistake. In NSG, we somehow need to be able to live through two of these. Runners will start this fight by mixing a Chaos Grenade to lower Evre's defense and inflict darkness so that Evre's single target physical attack won't hit us. Oren will then try and deal as much damage as possible, and Riku will use a Lunar Curtain to give Oren a boost in magic defense so that he can survive Poison Breath number 1. After this, we sub in Titus, as his speed is higher than Oren's, giving us ample time to revive the rest of the party. Once everyone's revived, Oren comes back in, and we deal a little bit more damage with Riku's mix, and then heal enough to survive one more Poison Breath. As before, Titus comes in to revive the party, and runners will finish off Evre with a grenade, Kimari self-destruct, and one last Riku mix. This boss fight requires a huge amount of knowledge and preparation on how to deal with the various situations that Evre will throw at you. It's very impressive to see a runner pull it off flawlessly. After this fight is done, the party lands the ship in Vivelle to rescue Yuna. 
runners fight their way through some guards. The primary strategy here being to have Riku put enemies to sleep with a sleeping powder grenade and use Auron to take out the Makina who can't be put to sleep. The party makes their way towards the stage and eventually reunites with Yuna and they go through another cloister of trials to get our final Aeon Bahamut. This is a short-lived victory however as the party is seized by guards and tried for the killing of Seymour. The maces of Bavel sentence the party to death by separating them and throwing them into the Via Purifico, an extremely dangerous dungeon. We start this segment as Yuna on her own and she needs to find the rest of the party. Lulu, Orin, and Kimari are also in this area, however runners will only meet with Orin, as they need to build some Aeon's overdrives and Orin makes this section a lot safer. On our way through the Via Purifico, runners need to ensure they've racked up a total of 270 encounters before beginning the next boss section. At the exit waits Isaru, a fellow summoner, who will not let the party through. We need to take down three of his Aeons with our own. Against his first Aeon Ifrit, we'll summon Shiva and take it out with Diamond Dust, Shiva's Overdrive. Next up is Valifor. We'll use Yuna's Overdrive Grand Summon, which summons an Aeon with a full bar of Overdrive, to re-summon Shiva and cast Diamond Dust immediately, using a few extra attacks if we under damage. Lastly is Bahamut. With no Diamond Dust pre-stocked and no Grand Summon, we simply use Blazara spells until a Diamond Dust is ready and end the fight with it. The remaining members of the party, Titus, Waka, and Riku, are in an underwater area of the Via Purifico. We run into an undead Evray, however this fight is significantly easier, as undead enemies take damage from healing and revive items. Runners will have any two characters hit Evray with a phoenix down each, and move on. The party escapes the Via Purifico, and are confronted by Maester Seymour. The party runs away while Kamari stays back to fend him off, but ultimately the party decides to go back and help him fight. We get some encounters on the way, which runners will use to build up Riku and Yuna's overdrive gauges before starting the fight with Seymour Natus. If runners have a spare chocobo feather, they'll use it to help Yuna keep up with the high speed stat of Seymour. Runners will have Riku mix a Chaos Grenade, as in addition to the drop in defense, Seymour is susceptible to poison, which runners will use to sneak in some extra damage. Yuna will then close out the fight with some Aeon's overdrives. Here we reach the Calmlands, an area where past summoners traditionally would fight Sin. These days however, it's a host to various minigames rather than being a battlefield. Runners will try to steal at least 5 Poison Fangs from Wasps for later fights, and build overdrives for Riku, Lulu, and Kimari. This is an example of an area in a JRPG speedrun where runners will take time to do optional bosses or minigames, as the rewards will either net them some time save later on, or make the run possible at all. This example is probably closer to the latter. Runners will participate in the Chocobo training minigame to learn to ride a Chocobo, and then participate in the Remium Temple Chocobo races for 30 units of the item Wings to Discovery. For simplicity, I'll refer to this item as Wings from here on out. As the party exits the Calmlands, some Guado guards bring out a Defender Marketer to try and stop them in their tracks. The strategy for this boss very much sets the pace for the remainder of the run, but you'll see why runners spent so much time with the chocobos to get those wings. Runners will have Riku and Lulu step in, and Riku will mix two wings to create the item Trio of 9999, which causes all damage dealt by the party to be boosted to 9999. Given that Defender X has 64,000 HP, runners will make use of Lulu's Fury Overdrive. This overdrive allows players to select a spell of Lulu's and cast it repeatedly depending on how many times you rotate the analog stick. Runners will use Thunder, as this spell has the shortest animation, and try and cast it 7 times to take the defender out. After the defender is defeated, the party heads to Mount Gagazet. At the base of Mount Gagazet, the party is stopped initially by the Ronso Maester, who refuses to let the party step foot onto the mountain where the Ronso live, as he's still convinced that we're traitors. After some arguing, Yuna's resolve and determination to fight Sin, despite the world turning against her and the party, persuades the Ronso Maester that the party's intentions are good, and allows them to proceed. Two of Kamari's tribesmen are not convinced though, and they want to put Kamari through one final test before trusting him with being Yuna's guardian. This boss fight restricts the player by only allowing them to use Kimari. 
Given that runners stocked up an overdrive in the calm lands, they'll open with Aqua Breath to deal some damage to both Ronso. Luckily, when Kimari successfully learns an enemy skill by using Lancet, he is given a full bar of overdrive and is able to use it immediately. Runners will abuse this to take out Biran quickly, and then use attacks to take out Yankee. The fight itself isn't too challenging as it scales to Kimari's level to ensure the player won't get stuck. The problem though is that the two Ronso have a chance of dropping return spheres used to return to a previous position on the sphere grid, as well as friend spheres used to teleport to any area of the grid that is currently occupied by another party member. Of course, these benefits are meaningless in NSG and runners will simply use the return spheres to add first strike to other party members' weapons to give them the first turn in future battles. The current strategies rely on getting at least one return sphere. This means that if runners encounter the 1.5% chance scenario in which neither Ronso drops a return sphere and they end up with two friend spheres, the run cannot continue. Runners will need to reload an auto save and complete the fight again and hope for at least one return sphere. Runners will prioritize adding first strike to Riku's weapon and if they happen to get a second, they'll add first strike to Lulu's weapon as well. As the party proceeds up the mountain, runners will make sure to build overdrives for Riku, Lulu, and Titus. On the way, the party meets Owaka's younger brother, and sell off a few of our wings to purchase a shield for Riku that casts haste when she's in critical health. We'll make sure to leave her in critical health intentionally as we're heading into most fights, as it allows the Riku to get the party set up to face bosses much quicker. Toward the top of the mountain, we face off against Seymour once again as Seymour Flux. It should be noted here that if a runner only happened to get one return sphere from Baran and Yankee, this variation of the fight strategy has a 25% failure rate, causing a game over. The player will need to then reload an auto save and try again, but the strategy itself is mostly the same. Runners will open this battle with either a Silence Grenade or a Poison Fang, as Seymour Flux is weak to a variety of statuses. Given that Riku is in critical health and thus has a speed boost, she gets another turn in before Flux, and runners will mix two wings for Trio again. Titus will use his Slice and Dice Overdrive to land a number of hits on Flux, and Lulu will use Thunder Fury, aiming to get around 6 to 8 Thunders. Depending on how many, Riku will either use an attack or a Fire Gem to finish off Seymour Flux, and the party proceeds to Xanakand. Xanakand is our last major city in the game, Titus' hometown that was said to have been destroyed over a thousand years ago, which now appears to be true. The party rests and looks back on their journey thus far, and then heads to the temple for the final Cloister of Trials. As is quite standard by now, runners will charge Titus, Riku, Lulu, and Yuna's overdrives for some upcoming fights. The last Cloister of Trials is somewhat of a matching minigame with these shapes that activate a podium once completed. Once all six podiums are activated, the party faces the Spectral Keeper. Runners open this fight with a Light Curtain on Auron to boost his physical defense, and then mix two wings for our usual trio setup. Runners will try to land exactly 5 hits of Thunder Fury, intentionally triggering the Spectral Keeper to counter with an AoE physical attack. This immediately builds the party's overdrives back again, and allows Auron to survive and finish the fight. The party then meets with Unaleska, an extremely powerful summoner who Yuna herself was named after. Unaleska reveals that the only way to defeat Sin is not only for a summoner to sacrifice themselves, but one of their own guardians too. Unhappy with this discovery, Yuna refuses to oblige, and Unaleska feels she has no choice but to free the party of their sorrows through death, and the party must defeat her. Unaleska, much like Seymour Flux and Evray, is a boss that consistently terrorizes casual players. Unaleska has 132,000 health over a total of 3 phases, and she boasts various instant death moves, as well as the ability to inflict the party with zombie, and then following up with healing spells to kill them instantly. Runners will have Riku open with a light curtain on herself to boost her defense, and then mix their usual two wings. Key members of the party will switch out for Walker and Auron, as they have the highest health, and will be able to tank Unaleska's first attacks. Once we're through her turn, Riku will use Fire Gem to get the first chunk of damage in. Titus will come back in and follow up with Slice and Dice, and Lulu will need to land at least 7 hits of Thunder Fury to close out the fight. With the only known way of defeating Sin gone forever, the party heads back to the airship to think of ideas on how to defeat Yu Yevon, who Unaleska reveals to the party is the spirit that is controlling Sin. 
After some time, the party remembers their brief run-in with Sin under the frozen lake in Markalania. They realise that Sin was docile while listening to the Hymn of the Faith, a song that's commonly found throughout the temples of Spira. The party decides to use the speakers on the airship and have all the residents of Spira sing the hymn at the same time to weaken Sin, allowing the party to stand a chance against it in a head-on fight. Sin is inevitably drawn to the sounds of the hymn, and we begin the last leg of the run. The party spots a weak point near Sin's left fin and decide to focus their attacks on it. The fight opens with Riku mixing two wings and having Lulu switch out for Kimari, as she'll be used later on. Runners will have Kimari repeatedly use Lancet, as Sin will swing his fin after it's attacked seven times. This counter-attack will build back Kimari and Riku's overdrives for runners to use later. Once Riku's overdrive is built back, Lulu will switch back in and finish the fight with Thunder Fury, and runners move on to the right side fin, where they repeat this strategy. With Sin weakened heavily, the party jumps down and faces another Sin spawn and Sin weak point. Riku will mix two wings, and runners finish the fight with Fire Gems and Titus' Slice and Dice Overdrive. After this, the party regroups and prepares for a head-to-head -head fight with Sin, now that it's significantly weaker. Runners, however, will detour to the Omega Ruins and stock up Titus, Riku, and Lulu's overdrives and check their equipment. Unileska has a chance of dropping weapons that can inflict Zombie, which will be extremely useful later on. If runners weren't fortunate enough to get one there, they'll buy 70 Holy Waters on the airship and customize one of their existing weapons to have Zombie Strike before proceeding any further. Here the party faces Overdrive Sin, a boss that has 140,000 HP and takes a few turns to draw the party in before attacking. During these turns, runners will mix their standard two wings and then use a combination of Lulu's Thunder Fury, Lancets with Kamari, and Spell Gems with Riku to win the fight. With Sin in rough shape, the party heads inside Sin's body to look for Yu Yevon. On the way, runners will build their overdrives back, and we're confronted by Seymour one final time, who has made his way inside Sin with plans to learn to control it from the inside. The fight has these symbols behind Seymour that dictate what elements he's weak to, but Trio of 9999 removes any need for runners to pay attention to this. They'll try and land 8 hits of Lulu's Thunder Fury. 9 will end the fight, but it's very difficult to land. If they manage to get at least 8, Titus will switch out for Kamari, who ends the fight with Lancet. It's technically faster to have Titus attack, but if the attack whiffs, runners risk a game over, so it's much safer to have Kamari swap in as Lancet can't miss its target. As runners approach the final stages of the game, they'll try and build up the usual overdrives one final time in preparation for the final Aeon and Yu Yevon fights. Once the final Aeon fight starts, Titus will talk to the final Aeon to prevent it from being able to take its first turn. Runners will then have the party switch weapons back and forth to set up for a specific turn order, and when ready, have Riku mix two wings, and get Titus to talk again to prevent its next turn. Players are only able to prevent two of the final Aeon's turns by talking to it, so at this point, runners will have Lulu switch out for Kimari to save her for later, and have Titus slice and dice to deal enough damage to head into the second phase of the fight. Riku will switch out for Yuna, who Grand Summons Shiva to cast Diamond Dust. This stops the Pagodas behind the final Aeon from healing the boss any further. Shiva, however, can't survive any attacks and is killed immediately. Riku will use a Fire Gem to deal some damage, leaving the final Aeon's health low enough for Lulu to finish the fight with 7 hits of Thunder Fury. With the final Aeon defeated and Yu Yevon having nowhere to go, it desperately tries to stay alive by possessing the Aeons that we've been fighting alongside throughout the whole game, and we must defeat our own Aeons one by one. For the most part, they're taken down with Poison Fangs and some elemental grenades that Riku can throw, but against Bahamut, runners will need to use Kamari's Self-Destruct to finish the fight. With all of our own Aeons defeated by our own hand, and nowhere left for Yu Yevon to go, we head into the very last fight of the game against Yu Yevon itself. Luckily, Yu Yevon is susceptible to the zombie status, which is why runners made sure they have a zombie strike weapon. Once inflicted with zombie, runners will throw a phoenix down at Yu Yevon, ending the fight and closing out the game.
the fight against sin is over and the people of Spira are safe. Though the party and the people of Spira must never forget the people and the friends they have lost or the dreams that have faded. It truly is a marvel that the community was able to come up with solutions for some of the most difficult bosses in the series and doing it with such a massive restriction. I really look forward to what solutions the community will come up with to mitigate the late game run ending situations such as the double friend sphere drop and the 25% chance loss against Seymour Flux, but it's only a matter of time before these problems are solved. I should note as well that this video didn't cover anything to do with the RNG tracking and drop manipulation. Modern strategies for speedrunning involve manipulating an armor drop in Mount Gagazette that prevents random encounters when equipped, netting runners huge time save in the late game. I'd highly recommend watching Dr. Swellman's video if you're interested in how the community optimized this speedrun and broke it wide open. While I love challenges like this, I realized while making this video that I haven't actually done one myself in years. I've done so many different Final Fantasy speedruns, but nothing with a restriction of this sort. So in the spirit of things, I've decided that over the next few weeks, I'll be learning the NSG run myself with a goal of completing it in under 10 hours. Make sure to follow me on Twitch if you're interested in watching me take on this challenge. Thank you to Chris Tenarium, Quonu93, and Kampa for acting as consultants on this video and answering some of the trickier questions I had about the run. Their channel links will be in the description if you're interested in their content, and so will mine. Thank you for watching.